Well, thank you, Danielle. It's a pleasure to be here talking to you all today. My name is Paul Thornton. I'm the medical director of the Congenital Hyperinsulinism Center in Cook Children's Medical Center in Fort Worth, Texas. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about hypoglycemia. So let's start off by defining hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is a word der derived from the Greek language that means low blood sugar. And sugar, which is also called glucose, is a very important source of energy for the body. It travels through the body in the bloodstream and moves to where it's needed, such as the liver, muscles, and most importantly, the brain. Now, when glucose goes to the liver, it's stored there as glycogen and can be released later on when the body needs more glucose. But when it goes to the brain, it generally goes straight into metabolism and forming energy. And it's important because normally more than 95% of the brain's energy comes from glucose. So we also should remember that hypoglycemia is not a disease. It is a sign or a marker of a disease. And so really we shouldn't say that our child has hypoglycemia. We should talk about the disease that's causing the hypoglycemia. Now it's important to know how to measure glucose. Typically, glucose is measured in the laboratory by taking a blood sample, usually from the arm, and putting it into a large chemistry analyzer. The result is then made in about 15 minutes, and it's reported either in millimoles per liter in most places in Europe, or in milligrams per deciliter in the United States. And if you want to convert from millimoles to milligrams, you just multiply by 18. Now, glucose can also be measured using a drop of blood from the finger using a glucometer, and it can be measured continuously by attaching a continuous blood glucose monitor to the body. And this has a small plastic tube that sits underneath the skin and measures the glucose in the interstitial fluid. It's important to realize that all glucose tests are not equal, with the lab test being the gold standard. And only the lab test should be used to diagnose hypoglycemia. So, for example, the Pediatric Endocrine Society guideline says that in order to diagnose someone as having hypoglycemia, the sample must be measured in the lab, and this is because it is the only truly accurate way to make a diagnosis. Now, why is glucose important? Well, the body is made up of lots of cells, and every cell needs fuel to work. Now, most cells can use different types of fuel from the food that we eat, but the brain can only use three types of fuel because the other types of fuel are unable to get into the brain. And they're blocked from getting into the brain by the blood-brain barrier. So the brain is able to use glucose, ketones, and lactate. However, it's important to remember that in the normal state, there is only glucose in the blood and there is usually very little ketones and very little lactate. Now, this system is very highly regulated. And in this slide, you can see in the green area, the good or target area for the blood sugar to be. And you can see the numbers are in both milligrams per deciliter, the big number, and millimoles per liter, the smaller number. So for example, a blood sugar of 70 milligrams per deciliter equals 3.8 millimoles per liter. Now, when the blood sugar is in the green or the target range, uh, insulin is the main hormone. And as the blood sugar starts to fall, insulin levels are suppressed. And then as the blood sugar starts to go down below 70, the body kicks in a series of responses called the neurogenic responses, where it secretes hormones like glucagon, epinephrine, cortisol, and growth hormone. And these hormones function to prevent the glucose levels from falling and specifically to try and keep them up above 70. But if the blood sugars fall down below 50, then the brain starts to respond, and this is called the neuroglycopenic responses. And as I mentioned earlier, glucose is the primary source of energy for the brain, so the only real thing the brain can do is increase the blood flow to the brain to try and get more glucose there, and then start using less glucose by switching off some of the functions. Now, how does the patient feel when the body is doing all these things? Well, typically, we start to feel symptoms when our blood sugar goes down below 60, but everyone's a little different. 
And the first symptoms we feel are the neurogenic symptoms, which are shakiness, pallor, and sweatiness. And then neuroglycopenic symptoms, which are lethargy, seizure, seizures, and coma, occur when the blood sugar starts to get down below 50, but really when you get down into the danger zone of around 30 milligrams per deciliter. And many of you who've had a fasting study will know that your doctor brought the blood sugar down to 50 milligrams per deciliter or 2.7 millimoles, because at that point in time, if you take a sample of the blood and measure all the hormones and all the intermediary metabolites, you can make a diagnosis of the cause uh, of the hypoglycemia. So why do people get hypoglycemia? Well, there's three main reasons. The first reason is starvation. Anyone will have a low blood sugar if we starve them for long enough. So for a normal newborn baby, they can go 12 to 15 hours, a one-year-old 15 to 18 hours, a five-year-old 24 hours, a 10-year-old can go 48 hours, and someone like me, a normal adult, could probably go 72 hours without eating before my blood sugar would go low. Now, another reason why people's blood sugars will go low is because of the effect of drugs. Uh, specifically, if they take diabetes drugs, which are designed to lower the blood sugar, uh, but these drugs in, in, in people with diabetes, if given by too much, or insulin, if given too much, can cause the blood sugar to go low. And then, of course, the main reason why we're all here today is disease. How do diseases cause a low blood sugar? Well, the main sort of causes of low blood sugars can be classified into different areas. The first area is hormonal abnormalities. So if a patient makes too much insulin, it causes their blood sugar to go low. Or if they don't have enough cortisol or growth hormone or ACTH, they can go, go low. Another big category is the glycogen storage diseases. And there are many types of glycogen storage disease. And the five I've outlined here, type 0, 1, 3, 6, and 9, are the ones that most commonly cause low blood sugars. Then there's disorders of gluconeogenesis. And this is, this is the pathway in which amino acids from protein and um, different types of sugars can be converted into glucose. And then we have the fatty acid oxidation disorders, um, which can be broken down into problems with the carnitine cycle or oxidation of the fatty acids or ketone utilization. And then lastly, we have a category called idiopathic, which basically means that we don't know the cause of the low blood sugar. So if your child has a low blood sugar disorder or you have a low blood sugar disorder, what are the main things that you need to know? Well, the first thing that you always need to know is why do you or your child have hypoglycemia and what is the disease called that's causing my hypoglycemia? Because if you ever go to the emergency room um, or you're in a, in, in a crisis and the ambulance comes to your house, you don't want to tell them I just have hypoglycemia. You want to say I have hypoglycemia due to because the treatments may be very different. So that's important. Everyone needs to know how to monitor their blood sugar. And for different conditions, and even for different children with the same condition, the frequency of testing the blood sugar will be a little different. Then you need to know how do I treat my disease when I'm well? And most importantly is how do I treat my disease when I'm sick? And so each one of you, whenever you go to see your specialist, your endocrinology, doctor or your metabolism doctor, you need to know the answers to all these questions so that you have a plan in place to help look after your child when they're both well and when they're sick. And with that, I'll finish up and say thank you very much for having me come talk and I'm happy to take any questions. So I'm just asking the question again. So we have we have uh, audio on you now. So. Do all pediatric patients or newborn babies with hypoglycemia, do they need to check blood, blood ketones? Okay, so I gave a really good answer the last time. I hope I can do just as good this time. <laughs> so the answer is that the, the current recommend, recommendations do not suggest that all newborn babies either have their blood glucose or their blood ketones or urine ketones checked. And there's several good reasons for that. Number one is 
normal babies can have low blood sugars, so we don't want to end up over treating normal babies. But from a ketone problem, most babies are not able to make ketones until they're at least 12 to 24 hours old. And so even if you measured them, they would be low anyhow, and it really wouldn't help. So at this point in time, there's no scientific evidence to suggest that we should check ketones. Now, what's more important is, and you know, sometimes we hear stories that make us as physicians cringe, but what's more important is that when a child comes into the hospital with symptoms consistent with hypoglycemia, then at that point in time, their blood sugars and their blood ketones should be measured. And that's very, very important. Thank you so much, Paul. And I just have one more question. If my child doesn't show signs of low blood sugar until it's critical, how can we monitor that to keep them safe? That's a very good question because one of the things we've learned is that our bodies start to adjust to low blood sugars. And the more often you have a low blood sugar, the less your body is able to respond to it. So really you cannot rely on clinical symptoms and you have to test the blood sugar and you have to understand in your child's case, how long can I normally go without eating before my blood sugar goes low? And if my child is sick, how long can I normally go? And then when you start to reach those points in time, you have to be very careful checking the blood sugar and checking the blood ketones uh, because sometimes you have more of a problem from the high ketones than the low sugar. So for your individual child, you have to understand what it is that gets my child into difficulties and then when do I need to start monitoring. So, you know, each person needs an individualized plan for their child. And it's very hard to give a generalized answer for everyone because as you're probably going to learn over the next two days, all of your children and all of you who have idiopathic ketotic hypoglycemia are going to be very different. 